भद्रम कर्णे शृणुयाम देवा भद्रम पश्येक्षजत्रा स्थिरंगुष्टुवागम सस्तनु व्यषेम देवित यदायु स्वस्ति न इंद्रो वृद्धश्रवा स्वस्ति न पूषा विश्ववेदा स्वस्ति नस्ताक्षो अरिष्टनेमी स्वस्ति नो बृहस्पतिर्दा ओ शांति 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 so we are about to start the third chapter and somebody pointed out that this today starts my third year here uh, i yesterday i completed classes wise i mean i've been two years now uh, in the center in new york well the third chapter of the mandukya karika which has four chapters the first one being agama prakarana the chapter on the upanishad itself the second chapter of mandukya karika is called vaitatya prakarana which means uh, the chapter on the falsity of the universe and the third chapter is called advaita prakarana which means a chapter on non duality and the fourth one is called alata shanti prakarana the chapter on quenching of the fire brand whatever that is we'll see in time but uh, the third chapter the chapter on non duality um you know it's probably the most important chapter you might say the, you say that for everything <laughs> it's the most important uh but it's most important in the sense that this is what vedanta is all about the absolute the atman brahman non duality so this is the chapter on non duality what see in the earlier chapter we talked about the the, the world as an appearance that it's not true in itself it's an appearance um not the absolute truth and why not this is this was all discussed in the in the in the second chapter but falsity of the world is a secondary teaching of advaita vedanta the primary teaching is the absolute nature of reality which which is our own reality so that is what is going to be discussed in this chapter and that's why it's very important and there are there are extraordinary insights into in this chapter which has 48 verses and um it is based on the the upanishad itself of course remember the structure of the text which we are studying the original text is called the mandukya upanishad which is a very short text it has only 12 uh, mantras and enveloping it all is the mandukya karika a series of verses composed by gaudapada who was shankaracharya's guru's guru so the mandukya upanishad the original text is embedded in the mandukya karika it it's in there where is it embedded in the first chapter so the first chapter co- contains the mandukya upanishad along with other karikas explanatory verses the second chapter is entirely composed of the karika uh, composed by um, gaudapada so is the third chapter third chapter we are going to not going to come across the upanishad itself we're going to come across the verses composed by gaudapada and the fourth chapter also are verses composed by gaudapada but and of course all these verses second chapter third chapter fourth chapter they are all based on the upanishad there's no doubt about that but especially this third chapter advaita prakarana is deeply rooted in the upanishad itself uh, so we need need to keep the the essential teaching of the upanishad in mind when we study the third chapter remember what did the upanishad say the upanishad said knowledge of the ultimate reality will solve all our problems knowledge of the reality will solve our problems what is the ultimate reality which is called brahman in the upanishads the ultimate reality is our own self what our real self not what we perceive to be ourself what we understand it right now 
if he, if he understood our real self as it is, then there would be no question of any further inquiry. If you know what is the truth, what is the need of inquiry? The Upanishad claims that we do not know the truth about ourselves. If you knew the truth about, about ourselves, then um, it would actually help us to transcend all the problems, all sufferings in life. Now that's a very big claim to make. How do you go about it? Each Upanishad has its own approach. The Mandukya has its very unique and very well-known approach. It is the approach of examining the self um, through, the, uh, through the phenomena of waking, dreaming and deep sleep. It says, the self, what we are, is the ultimate reality. And this self, Atman is Brahman. In fact, the Mahavakya and the Mandukya Upanishad says, I am Atma Brahma. This very self is the ultimate reality Brahman. I'm giving a quick recaptu recapitulation of the Upanishad itself <coughs> within a few minutes because that's the groundwork. And we need to keep that in mind when we discuss over the next few weeks when we discuss this uh, chapter. This very self is the ultimate reality. Then the Upanishad said, if you remember, Soyam Atma Chatushpat. This self has four aspects, three of which are well known to us and the fourth one is what, is what we are trying to point out, what the Upanishad is trying to teach us. So the Atman has, the self has four aspects. In Sanskrit the aspects are called Pada, aspect. So four aspects, one, two, three and four. <coughs> Um, the first aspect is, um, uh, uh, is what is called the waker. The second aspect is the dreamer. I mean, who we are when we dream, in our dreams. The deep sleeper. In our deep sleep. And uh, each of them, they experience a world. This is the self and the world, um, the subject and the object. Each one experiences a world. The waker experiences a, a physical world, a subtle world, and the deep sleeper experiences the potential or causal, the darkness. Physical or gross. Gross in the sense of physical. You remember the Upanishad. The waker experiences the world through the senses. If this seems unfamiliar, actually it is just a, what is called, a, um, in Sanskrit they call it Anuvada. Anuvada does not mean translation. In, in Indian languages, Anuvada means translation. The, in philosophy, Anuvada means a repetition of our experience. A description of our experience. This is how we experience life. You are the waker right now and you are experiencing a world of sights and sounds and smell and taste and touch. And internally, <coughs> this, this subtle universe is experienced all the time, but especially in dreams. Uh, right now also we experience the subtle universe. When we look inside and find thoughts and feelings and emotions and memories and desires, that's the subtle universe, the world of our thoughts, our mind. But that becomes most vivid in dreams, where the external world is cut off. When you fall asleep, the, the senses, sensory system is shut down and you experience, live in a world of dreams. That's the second one, the subtle. And all of this is merged in a blankness, which uh, we call deep sleep. <coughs> and that is also, we realize, we, there's also a kind of experience, where you are the deep sleeper and you uh, experience the causal. Causal means the subtle universe and the gross are, from your point of view, they are merged in the, in, the blank, in the blankness of deep sleep. Why it's causal? Because from your point of view, all of this which you experience seems to emerge from, from your deep sleep experience. When you wake up, it's all there. I know that we assume it was there and we did not see it, but from your perspective, it seems that all your experiences were merged into blankness, nothingness. In deep sleep, it goes away. And in, when you dream or wake up, it seems to come back again. So from that perspective, the deep sleep is seen as a... Gaudapada in the first chapter described it as a seed state. 
as a causal state, as a potential state. And remember again, um, these, all of these had Sanskrit names. The first one, the waker was called, do you remember? Vishwa. The dreamer was called Taijasa. Yeah, don't be shy. Taijasa, tell me. <laughs> I feel happy when I hear you. Uh, Pragya. When you, when I, so at least some people remember the names. Pragya. And these all had, had um, cosmic dimensions also. What I mean by cosmic dimension is there's an individual dimension. Each of us is individual. So you are a waker, I am a waker, each of us is a waker right now, hopefully. And, but all the wakers, sentient beings put together, there's the, the conception of one consciousness in which all of us are united right now. And that one was called Virat. If you remember, Virat. A consciousness in which the entire universe is united together. That is called the the cosmic aspect of God, the gross cosmic aspect of God. Then in just the, the cosmic mind, all minds together, something like a mental uh, world wide web, Hiranyagarbha. That's called, it wouldn't be far from calling it, uh, far from truth if you called it the mind of God, you know, the term the mind of God. And the causal aspect is consciousness with the power of Maya, which projects all of this. So that was called Ishwara. So this is the self, subject, the object, and this is God, basically. Same thing, they are not three gods, they are not three selves, no more than you are three. You are the same person you are. But as your experience changes, it's, it's actually a direct description of our experience. With a slight uh, uh, caveat here that this thing is, of course, based on faith uh, to some extent. Because I know I am a sentient being here within myself and associated with a body and mind. I know it. I experience it directly. So do you. Each of us undeniably experiences this. But there is a consciousness associated with all beings in this universe which considers the entire universe to be its body which is described in the Bhagavad Gita in 11th chapter, that is a matter of faith for us. In fact, to some extent, that you are a conscious being in that body is a matter of faith for me also. Because I take it for granted, but I don't experience it directly. I experience you as a body, that you are there. I experience you as your behavior, your language. But I don't experience you internally as I experience myself. So even there, in philosophy, it's called the problem of other minds. Uh, that's actually discussed. It's, it's a chapter in the philosophy of mind in any textbook. How do you know that other beings have minds? We just see their behavior and bodies. So it could be a robot or zo zombie. <laughs> so, all right. So this is what was discussed uh, in the first few mantras of the Upanishad. Then, what the Upanishad... So basically, this is not anything new. This is uh, just a description of our... Experience in Sanskrit, Anuvada, a, a repetition of our experience, a daily experience. Now, what the Upanishad said was, these are three aspects of the self, of yourself, but there is a fourth, the fourth, Turiya, Turiyam, Turiya or Turiyam. Turiyam literally means the fourth. Turiyam means fourth. Uh, it doesn't mean anything else. What is that? It's pure consciousness. Or pure awareness. That pure consciousness, as you, if you remember, it's not actually a fourth thing apart from these three. These three are different from each other. Um, the waker and the waker's world is one. The dreamer and the dreamer's world is a separate thing. They, they don't seem to share the same time and space. And the deep sleeper is again separate, a completely different experience from these two. But Obviously, they are all your experiences. So, who are you apart from being a waker, dreamer or deep sleeper? You are awareness itself. In the stage of awareness, these three or let's say two plays, two dramas are enacted and the deep sleeper has no drama at all. It's just empty stage. But the stage is consciousness. You are that. 
You are awareness, you are being itself. Sat, Chit, Ananda, that is called Turiya. So, this was the teaching in the uh, Upanishad. Now, the second chapter, what the Upanishad taught also was that the self, the ob- subject and the object, that these two pairs in the three, these three states, these three aspects, the first three aspects, they are appearances. They are not real in themselves. What is real is the fourth. So the fourth one appears as these three. In fact, when you say the first three are appearances and the fourth one is real, this is actually the central teaching of Advaita Vedanta. Again and again we hear Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya. Brahman alone is real, the world is an appearance. In the language of the Mandukya Upanishad, how will you say Brahman alone is real and the world is an appearance? The fourth alone is real. Yeah. Satyam, let, us, let me use the Sanskrit. The phrase is, Brahman is real, the world is an appearance. In the Mandukya terms, the fourth is real. Satyam, real. And the world, what is the world in this, this scheme? One, These three. One, two, three, yeah, exactly, very good. One, two, three, Mithya. Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya in Mandukya language is this, Mithya. And the <coughs> phrase Jiva Brahmevanapara, the sentient being is none other than Brahman, is that you, remember, what, what did we discuss? That the self has four aspects. So the conclusion is, it's not that the self really has four aspects. The self is really this fourth and it is experienced or appears as the three. After this realization, this life will still continue to happen like this. But you do not no longer uh, think that you are this particular body mind and this is the real universe. Rather, you are the consciousness in which body mind experiencing a physical universe appears, in which the subtle uh, the, 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 the dreamer experiencing a subtle universe appears, in which the deep sleeper experiencing the blankness of deep sleep appears and again cycles back. None of them are real in themselves. What is real is the fourth which you are. This is unlimited. These are all limited. This is unlimited. This is the ground of this appearance. This is the reality. This is the appearance. Satyam Mithya. Okay. Now, hold on to the questions. Before we start the next verse, the first verse of the third chapter, then I'll take a few questions. But right now, let me complete the introduction. Okay. Now, what I wanted to say was, the the aspects, one, two, three, And the fourth one. These three are the appearance and this is the reality. Notice some things about this. All this we have, we have um, read in the first chapter. But I want to bring it forward again before we start the third chapter. It will be relevant. It's the foundation on which we shall proceed. Notice, I'll make three points here. The first point is, Cause and effect. Um, Effect, effect, cause. The waking, 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 dreaming, deep sleep. The first three, there is causality. The physical universe is what you might call the gross effect. In Sanskrit, karyam. Karyam. Karyam means effect. And karanam means cause. The, f- the world of appearance is where causality has its play. 
This is a very important point that Gaudapada will build upon. See, this, this third aspect is called the causal state. Um, in fact, God or Ishwara is, is the causal aspect of which the universe is an effect. In religions, that's why God is called the creator. Because the universe is supposed to uh, emerge from God, exist in God and disappear back into God. So God is the cause of the universe, on religious language the creator, and the universe is the projection or creation of God, and so on. And this is what Gaurapada points out, cause and effect. Our physical universe which we experience here is an effect. Um, it is a gross effect or a physical effect. Our subtle universe which we experience inside is also an effect. Effect means a product. But it's a subtle product. Sukshma. And the cause of that uh, is, the, uh, is the causal state, the, the pragya uh, or the Ishwara. Please sit. So cause and effect. In these three states, there is cause and effect. And the fourth one is beyond cause and effect. In Sanskrit, karya karana vilakshana atma. Atma is the self, the real self is beyond causality. This is within causality. One of them is the cause and the other two are the effect. Basically, the law of karma has its, uh, has its full run here. Whereas this one is beyond causality. The fourth one is beyond causality. The Turiya is neither a cause nor an effect. Neither cause nor effect. Or beyond causality. Let me say beyond causality. In Sanskrit, Karya Karana Vilakshana Atma. Vilakshana other. Beyond causality. There is a rope which appears as a snake. The ignorance of the rope is the cause of this appearance. And the snake which appears, the error, is the effect. The cause is ignorance of the rope and the effect is the rope appearing as a snake. But the rope itself is neither cause nor effect. It has nothing to do with ignorance, and nothing to do with the error of it appearing as a snake. It's completely unaffected by both. Or you may take a different example, the classic example of the clay uh, pot. The pot is the effect, the lump of clay is the cause. The clay pot is the effect, the lump of clay is the cause. Before the name and form of the pot were, before, before they appeared, it was a lump. It was, it, was not, it was a featureless mass. From that emerged various kinds of pots, a featureless mass. But the clay in itself, is neither a featureless mass nor a pot. It's just clay. In itself, it's neither a cause of anything nor an effect of anything. So in that sense. Notice, however, cause and effect are not possible without this. Without the clay, neither the lump is possible nor the pot is possible. Without the rope, neither the ignorance of the rope is possible nor the mistake called a snake is possible. You see what I'm saying? So the turium, the rope, or the, or the clay, it serves as the ground of cause and effect. Turiyam, pure consciousness, it serves as the ground of causality. In, in itself, it's not affected by causality. It's not involved in causality. That's why in religions, mystics have called this one, this the, the ground of God. Not God itself, the Godhead or the ground of God. Because God comes afterwards at the causal state. And the world is an effect. So God is the cause, world is an effect, but the absolute is neither cause nor effect. And uh, what Vedanta wants to say is, you are that absolute. So this is the first point I wanted to say. Cause and effect, they have their full run in that world of appearance. In the gross effect, which is waking world, in the subtle effect, which is our dream world, and in the causal uh, realm, which is our deep sleep. Uh, experience or in the uh, it makes more sense if you talk of it talk of it from God's point of view 
as God itself, it is causal. As the cosmic mind and the physical universe, it is effect. But as Brahman, neither cause nor effect. What practical result does it have for our spiritual life? This kind of abstract thinking. Notice that causality in our life is manifested as karma, as the law of karma. Law of karma is nothing other than causality. Cause leads to effect. If the cause is good, the effect is good. If the cause is bad, the effect is bad. Um, Swami Vivekananda put it this way. Good, good, bad, bad, and none escape the law. But whosoever wears a form, a form is always called, uh, it's an effect always. Whosoever wears a form must wear the chain too. What is a form? It's a subtle effect or a gross effect? Must wear the chain too. And then what is the fourth, the turiyam? So Swami Vivekananda says, but far beyond name and form, here, name and form, <coughs> is Atman ever free. No, thou art that sannyasi board. Thou art that sannyasi board. Say Om Tat Sat Om. That song of the sannyasin, that, that song is there. Okay. So within causality is the world, good and bad. So good is dharma, moral action done consciously. And the result of moral action is called punya or merit. And the result of merit is sukha, happiness in this world. And the... Um, and if one is deliberately naughty, adharma, the result is papa or demerit. And the result of demerit is unhappiness, misery, dukkha. And the whole thing, dharma, punya, sukha, adharma, papa, dukkha, this whole thing is causality, karma. And it has its full run in this, this realm. But the underlying reality is not affected by any of this. It's not real. From this point of view, from the Turian point of view. That's one point I wanted to make. The second thing I want to say is, it's easier. Um, notice that in this realm, the causal and the subtle and the gross, the three aspects, the first three aspects, there is change. There is continuous change. In this world, everything is changing. We are also changing, this world is also changing birth and growing up and um, middle age and old age and death. We are there, we are going through that and the world is changing so much. In our subtle worlds also, dreams full of changes, faster. And the deep sleep, the causal realm doesn't seem to be changing, but definitely we enter it and come out of it. We enter it and come out of it. So, everything seems to go in there, but everything seems to re-emerge from there also. On a vaster scale, the universe, from the causal uh, aspect, Ishwara and Maya, emerges the, the entire universe. It runs its course and again dissolves back into Ishwara and Maya. Um, Srishti, projection, Stiti, existence, Pralaya, dissolution. This cycle goes cause to effect, back to cause again. Seed to treat, back to seed again. And so the cycle runs. But this runs here. So change has its... Hold on uh, until I finish the introduction. Then we will ask the, and we'll deal with the question. So change. The second point I wanted to make here is change. Uh, everything is impermanent. Anityam. Temporal. Change. That's there in these three. But the Turiyam, there's no change there. It's not static. It's beyond the concept of change or unchanging. So the, the causal seems to be static and everything in the waking and dreaming seems to be dynamic, but it's one cycle. But uh, the Turiyam, the ground of this reality is beyond change. Change means time. So the first three are within time. Time is here. Uh, time is here. In a seed form, time is called Maya, here in the causal state. And its effect we see in, dream, in dreams and in waking, in the subtle and in the physical universe, time. But Turiyam is beyond time. Beyond time does not mean uh, eternal, not in the sense of something which lasts for a pretty long time, in that sense eternal. No, no, no. Uh, that is also within time, which lasts in time. But Turiyam is beyond time. There's, it's timeless. There's no question of time there. 
time, space and causation have not begun yet in, in, in Turiyam. In, there is no, um, it, it's beyond time. There's no change, no time. Okay. Um, the third point I want to make is, three points I wanted to make. The first one, if you remember, beyond cause and effect. Turiyam is Karya Karana Vilakshana Atma. The self is beyond cause and effect. But here the self is within cause and effect. Waking, dreaming, deep sleep. Second one is, here we experience change and time. Whereas Turiya is beyond change, changeless. Changeless means birthless, deathless. I gave a talk on that, birthless, deathless. I think I gave a talk. So Turiyam is, 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 does, is not born nor does it die. Beyond creation and beyond destruction. And the third point I wanted to make was, here there is duality. In the first three there is duality, Dvaitam. And in Turiya is Advaitam, non-duality. In the first three, subject and object, you experience yourself and the other. In the waking state we do that. In the dream state we do that. And in deep sleep we do not do that. But it's there in the seed form. Because it comes back. Duality, the potential duality is there. When you wake up it comes back. The universe when it is in the seed form as Ishwara and Maya doesn't seem to be any physical universe apart from God. But when Srishti, projection starts, there is a, multi, um, a pluralistic universe out there. So duality, multiplicity is present. Subject, object is present in the first three. Whereas in Turiyam, the ground of all of this, the fourth, the reality, there is no duality, Advaitam. So let me sum up. What did I say? The first three are affected by, in Sanskrit, or let's put it in English. Causality, change, duality. Whereas, Turiyam, beyond causality, change, and it is also non dual. In Sanskrit, the first three padas, the first three aspects, they are, they are within karya karana, they are cause and effect. They are anityam, impermanent, changing, savikaram, subject to change and modification, continuous change, flux. And dvaitam, dual, dualistic. Whereas the turiyam is karya karana vilakshana, beyond cause and effect. It is... Um, it is nirvikara, beyond change, beyond modification. And it is advaitam, non-dual. Wait. At the bottom is not change, it should be permanent. Hmm? I said beyond. Beyond, beyond causality, beyond change. So there is no causality and no change here in Turiyam. I'm glad you can read it from there. Your eyes are good and... <laughs> My handwriting is not as bad as I supposed it was. Okay, um, right. Here is the point. Samsara, our worldly existence, is this. In philosophical language, this is samsara. Causality, change, duality. Karya, karana, savikara, dvaita is samsara, is our world. It's just a description of our world. Nothing very um, new I'm saying. Just as we experience the world. This is some, when you are subject to these, you are in samsara. When you are not subject to these, you are, this is called moksha. Moksha. What is moksha? Beyond causality. Beyond change or modification. And beyond duality. Non-dual. So, advaita is moksha. Nirvikara is moksha. Karya, Karana, Vilakshana, beyond cause and effect, is Moksha. Moksha is freedom from the law of karma. As Swami Vivekananda said, far beyond name and form. Uh, that good, good, bad, bad, beyond all of that is Moksha. So, our aim is Moksha, freedom from samsara, freedom from suffering. So, that is possible here, not here. As long as we identify ourselves as the waker or the dreamer or the deep sleeper, now one more thing, 
So when you see it in this way, what is the journey from uh, samsara to moksha? Is it a journey from the gross to the causal? Is it a journey from the gross to the causal? It, now I am a body mind, um, but at one point uh, after death or somewhere I will go to a heaven where I'll be one with God in a causal form, you know. I am now separate from God and then I will become one with God at some time, will become, will go to heaven or attain God, that kind of thinking, that is, notice, that is causality. I am in an effect form, I will go back to a seed form. I I am uh, uh, subject to change, I will go back to a kind of static changelessness there. Uh, I am subject to duality here, when I say I will attain God, I am a sentient individual being, uh, weak and helpless and um, fallen, I will attain to um, the all-powerful, omnipresent, omnipotent God. So that kind of thinking, um, that, that is not the way to attain moksha. The way to attain moksha is that not causality, not change, not duality, my nature as, as Turiya, that is moksha. Right here, right now, all the time. It's like the clay pot saying, now I am a pot, but I will become my clay nature when I am reduced to a lump. No, whether you are a lump or a pot, you are the clay. Now I am a wave in the ocean, subject to increase and decrease and diminution and being wiped out. Um, When there is no wave, it will be flat ocean, then it is freedom. I will be water. No, 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 no. Whether you are water, you are a wave or there is no wave in the ocean, you are still water at every time. You have to. What does the wave have to do to become water? What does the pot have to do to become clay? What does the false snake have to do to become the real rope? Just to know it, Just to know it yes. Not to change things. Just to notice. I am always. So that moksha here is accomplished by knowledge of one's reality. What is that one's reality? The Turiyam. What's our present understanding? Waking, dreaming, deep sleep. What is? What are we trying to do? See the Turiyam here, right now, here and now. That sets us free. You realize the non-causal, beyond change, um, non-dual nature of the self, of yourself. Foundation for third chapter. Quick. Mm. So the first one, the, the fourth state, is like a waking up. It must be an aha moment. Because we sit here, we come here every week, we study, we hear it, we, we conceptualize it in our head. But something must happen for us to have that realization, that aha moment, where the penny drops. Yes. And something internally must happen for us to, like to Michael Singer, where he suddenly finds himself, you know, <coughs> in the movie, but... Sh- Everyone in the movie, everything, yes. feelings. So it's like an aha moment. Yes, it will happen. And, and that's the, uh, it's like an internal shift. What happens is the ignorance of the Turium. It's not that you become the Turium. It's that we, we have this ignorance that I am not the Turium. It's like the clay pot thinking, I'm a pot, but I'm not clay. Somehow I have to become clay. It's a wrong notion. That is corrected. So that wrong notion that... Notion is too weak a word to call it. It's so powerful. It's not just a notion or something, but it's so powerful. But still, it's just uh, just in the mind. Ignorance in the mind is removed by knowledge in the mind. Turiyam remains the Turiyam. Remember, that aha moment, the penny dropping, it does not make you into the fourth. You are already that. You realize it. Right now, we don't realize it. But then uh, then you realize it. And you realize you've always been it. It has always been all right. And it happens in an internal shift suddenly. That's a very good word, internal shift. It's, it's what might, you might call a paradigm shift. A sudden dropping of the veil. Swami Vivekananda says it's like a trick picture. I've given this example earlier. That he says like, um, you know, in one of those pictures, it seems to be a mass, a jumble of dots and things and patterns. And say, they say that there is a, a flower there or there is a tiger there in the jungle. And suddenly things fall into place. 
you can see the tiger there. Oh, I can see it. And w Swami Vivekananda says, once you have seen it, it's done. Yeah, it's done. Again, the next time you see it, it might seem like a jumble, but it will take a very, it, almost instantaneously, you can see the tiger behind the jumble. So, that's an example out there. This is for your own experience. Second question. One more. Maybe a stupid one, but just to clarify. So, as long as I'm in the first, uh, the one, two, three, how does it work? So, birth and death, I go back to the after, the after plane, the after world, where would that fall? Um, I am using your word astral because the word astral is not used here. What probably it is meant by astral is a subtle word. The subtle word. After death, the place where you go is subtle? It's subtle, definitely. Until you get a physical body back again. Not only after death, right now also, in dreams, where do you go? Subtle, subtle word. So it's the same place? It, it is. It falls it under the same category. It all falls under the same category, yes. Beyond the ast what you might call the astral, or here we are translating sukshma as subtle, you can translate it as astral also. Um, beyond that lies something else uh, called the causal, karana. But all of them are appearances in, in one unchanging reality. Having said this, let's start the third chapter. The third chapter actually continues very nicely from the end of the second chapter. Remember the end of the second chapter? What are you supposed to do? See the reality within, see the reality outside. Tattvam adhyatmikam drishtva, tattvam drishtva tu bahyata. See the tattva means impersonal reality. See it inside yourself as yourself. Turiya, I am that. See it outside, that everything is actually that reality. And then tattvi bhutaha, realize that I am that tattva. The tattva means that impersonal principle. Tadarāmaha, very important. Not only is it being and awareness, but it is also ānanda, bliss, completion. Tadarāma means resting in that, finding completion in that, finding wholeness, pūrnatva in that. Then you don't require anything else outside. You don't require anything more. You are not going around in the world with a begging bowl for, for satisfaction, for completion, for happiness. Tattvi bhūta, tadarāma, Tattvad apracyuto bhavet. Do not slip away from that truth. Or once you realize it, you cannot slip away from that truth. I am, suppose I am John or, or Bill. However much I try, however much I pretend, I cannot slip away from my Bill uh, or John identity right now. In that way, it must become like that. Become means that it is that, but the clarity must come that way. Um, how do we slip away? Think about it. You know, if you, if you examine it, the glory of this, this tattvam, this turiyam, we think, for example, we are completed, made whole by, in Sanskrit it is called bhoga, enjoyment. <laughs> money, if I have my money, I am whole, I am complete, uh, I am much better off. I have lost all my money, I am reduced, I am diminished, I am unhappy. Health, or people around me, relatives, family, people, who, employees, you know, people who work for me, I feel complete and whole and powerful. And when those are lost, I feel diminished thereby. My possessions, Fine gadgets or my act, my, my um, you know, my vacations, the things that I've done, my hard drive full of all the selfies I've taken in all parts of the world, that adds to my sense of self. That is the false self. It is subject to increase and decrease, getting it and losing it. <coughs> I am better off or I was better off at that time, now I'm much worse off. I was really happy, now I'm old and sad and lonely. This is the self which is, which is being whirled around restlessly in these three states. Heaven, earth and hell. Daily waking, dreaming, deep sleep. But heaven, earth and hell, you know, different worlds, life after life being whirled around. Bound to suffer. Suffering is guaranteed there, in, if you are in this state. If, if my increase and decrease, my, my happiness depends on bhoga. 
Uh, but the Turiya does not, is not increased or decreased by Bhoga. It is complete in itself. Bhoga means experience. People, money, health, objects of the world, power, achievements. What achievements? What degrees? What, have, what uh, wealth and money? The moment you go to sleep every night, at night, it's gone. Suppose I don't wake up again. It's gone forever. How is it any different from a, than, a, than a dream? So, the real self, the consciousness in which all of them appear and disappear, that is not affected by bhoga. It is not affected by karma, by doing. You see, I am enhanced by the things that I have done, my achievements in life, my good deeds. This is from the law of karma. I have done many great deeds. I have helped so many people. I am much better. I have great karma. Or I have done miserable things. I am the worst of sinners. And I deserve hell. Uh, I, I am, I am um, lowly. Um, I, I am a loser. I have not accomplished anything in life. All my potentialities. The modern world is full of, of achieving your potential. I didn't actualize my potentialities. Uh, so I am reduced by it. Uh, that is the self here. Subject to this. But the real self is neither... Uh, the, the, one of the descriptions of enlightenment to the Upanishad is at the point of death, this one does not bemoan you know, that, that why did I not do great things in life? Kimaham sadhuna karavam, why did I not do holy things, great things, dharmic things in life? Kimaham papam akaravam, for what reason did I do sin? Did I harm people? Was I mis- uh, uh, did miserable things? So yeah, that's right. This is a sign of a good person. It's a sign of an ignorant person. That's why this Upanishad is so, so shocking. It says the enlightened person does not think that way. It is neither increased nor decreased by work, karma, good and bad. It's not affected at all. Hold on, no questions now. Uh, that is what is meant by tattvada prachyato bhavet. It does not slip away from its glory by... Um, Neither increased by good deeds, nor diminished by bad deeds. Thoughts. I am a holy person. I think of God and moral. I think of the welfare of the world. Uh, Good thoughts. So I am a much better person now. I am a a hopeless person. I am plagued by bad thoughts. I am plagued by horrible thoughts. I can't get out of the cycle of negative thinking, depression. See, the self is enhanced by thinking, is diminished by thinking. Good thoughts, bad thoughts, controlled mind, uncontrolled mind. So, yeah, that's right. Ignorance. <laughs> Absolutely not. That's again why this Upanishad is so shocking. You see, the self, the Turiyam is neither enhanced by your thinking, not in the slightest, is neither diminished by your thinking. The noblest, the holiest of thoughts. They all have their role to play. Be careful. Or the worst of thoughts. The most paranoid of thoughts. The most uh, uh, compulsive. People are, you know, they are tortured by their thoughts. Self, the turium, when you realize that, absolutely unaffected. Just think about it. Our, think about it. Our thoughts, up to where do the thoughts have their effect on you? In waking they do, in dreaming they do. In deep sleep itself the thoughts disappear. You still exist as the experiencer of the blankness. What thought is there? Where is the holiest person there? Where is the... How evil is Hitler in deep sleep? Is he full of maniacal homicidal tendencies in deep sleep? No. In seed, it's there. He'll come back again with the moment the guy wakes up. But uh, he said about killing people. But in deep sleep, no. In coma, deep sleep, no. So beyond the deep sleep also is the ground of these appearances. Not at all affected by thought. Not increased or diminished by thinking. Not increased or diminished by doing. Not increased or diminished by experiencing or enjoying or suffering. Bhoga, karma, or thoughts, chitta vritti, none of them have any effect on it. 
that is why it is called apratyuto bhavet it cannot slip away from its glory no matter what what uh, what is done to it what the thoughts torture people um, the subtle kind of torture is much more um, sometimes much more painful than the physical torture sometimes i was reading a very famous one of the most famous american poets sylvia plath this is a, she committed suicide at a very young age brilliant but if you see the poems they're dark um the uh, the fig tree i think she is sitting under a, she talks about the fig tree but i can't repeat the exact lines they are very beautiful she is sitting under a fig tree like thinking about her life what she will do and there are there are these different kinds of um figs the fruits on the tree and she says uh, I, if i remember what, so what will i be in life these are the things possibilities in life ahead of me and i see myself as a fulfilled you know like a um an explorer in far of africa or something as a renowned academician or a writer uh, or as um, you know as a, a, a mother and a wife and fulfilled uh, in, in one kind of life and this or that and this and many many other wonderful things dreams are there and i wait and sit under the tree and i wait and watch and think which one will i be which one to choose until they all begin to shrivel and dry up and drop from the tree and there's nothing left anymore that is not her story it's everybody's story how many of those fruits can you pluck and experience in your life one or two or three the rest still remain and they will disappear old age will come disease will come body will break down life will slow down and finally end she was sensitive enough to see it she was sensitive enough to see it um somebody said no wonder when people shoot themselves they shoot themselves in the head to make it stop so even thoughts can have absolutely no effect on you atattvad apratchito bhavet not slipping away from the truth wait one more point here not only this even at this point even at this point there might be a there is usually i we have come across this question in class again and again i understand all of that it's wonderful but at least one thing is necessary i must remain centered in this truth i must first grasp it and then i remain centered i am brahman i am turiyam i am the pure consciousness i am the isness witness witness consciousness i told you this earlier also uh, the teacher who said this is exactly what you must not do somebody said to the teacher uh, aam brahmasmi itna to pakad ke rakhna hai this is what i must and the teacher said wahi to nahi karna that's exactly what you must not do why not because that's the last fight that's the last stronghold of the mind the mind is still promising you i will give you okay you don't want anything in the world <laughs> you loser <laughs> uh, but you don't want heaven you don't because everything that the mind can give you you are saying i don't want it all right what do you want then you want to be enlightened you want to know that you are brahman okay i'll give you that <laughs> appoint me to that position and to to take care of your brahmanhood for you <laughs> dismiss that guy from that position also then the mind disappears this appears means not physically you are no longer the mind mind will still remain body will remain mind will remain but you are no no you are free of it you suddenly you see a vast expanse of yourself beyond the mind see means you realize yourself as you're set free from it there's an ex- there's a meditation i think yoga vashishta very powerful meditation you should try it before starting meditation strongly suggest this to your mind two things tell your mind very strictly this mind whatever mind means any thought any perception any memory any desire any ambition including the ambition to be enlightened all of that whatever the mind can present tell the mind whatever you can present whatever you can think of conceive of remember uh, i am not interested one the want the thing that i am interested in you cannot conceive of it it's beyond your range if you strongly put this dual suggestion into the mind whatever you can do i'm not interested 
And what I am interested in, there is an aspiration. It must be maintained, otherwise enlightenment will not come. And it's actually the mind itself is being used to do this. Drive it into the mind. There is something that uh, I want to realize. But that you can't help me. It's beyond your capacity. If you sit down with this powerful thought, you will see the mind will just disappear. It will shrink away. And I told, I was teaching this technique once in, uh, in, in Hollywood. And somebody, you know, felt very bad for the mind and went, oh, <laughs> poor mind. It's, it's like a puppy who's been scolded. Yeah. Stop. Don't think. Don't talk. Don't think. Don't remember. Don't desire. Don't plan. Not interested in your products. I'm not buying. And what I want, you cannot sell. You don't have it. So the mind retreats. It shrinks away. This is what the uh, Tattva da Prachito Bhavet in that verse. Shankaracharya's commentary we read. I was centered in Brahman when my mind was calm. Do you remember last time we read? Now my mind has become restless. I have moved away from my Brahman nature. And Shankaracharya says, don't be like that. Do you remember last time we read that? Don't be like that. You cannot move away. It's a mind tricking you again. You, you cannot move away from yourself. Nothing that the mind does can take you away from yourself. Memory and realization are two different things. Very quickly, focus on this. Memory and realization are two different things. First, realization is direct. Memory is a recollection of something that happened earlier. So even if you had mystic experiences, and some people say that I had that elevating experience. You had that experience means you had it in the past. Now you are just recollecting it. That experience is not here now. See, right here, I'm here in, in front of you. Are you remembering me or seeing me? Seeing. Yeah. If you stare at me and you say, Swami, I'm remembering you, it, it sounds very odd. No. Memory is not required when you are directly seeing something. You're not remembering something, you're seeing. Realization is, that, is, is like that seeing. It's not like memory, not like trying to remember something. The mind tricks you into that. Remember, see what my guru taught me, what I read in the Vedanta class, what experience I had in meditation six years ago in the Himalayas. Those are all memory. You can think about that, no harm. But that's not realization. Not necessary also. Not necessary. Not necessary for this. So memory and realization are two different things. Realization is direct experience. Memory is recollection of past experience. The second thing about that memory and thing is, is that who, what do you remember? What do we use memory for? We recollect, we remember things we like or dislike. Raga Dvesha. A food which I like, I try to remember eating it. A person I like, I try to remember meeting that person. A place I like, I try to remember, um, you know, uh, my memories of that place. Or dislike. A person I dislike, memory brings it back. I'm thinking about that annoying person. Or a painful experience, memory brings it back. Haunt, I'm haunted by painful memories. But one's own self, you yourself, you are not an object of hate or liking. Desire or rejection is not possible for your essential self. It's always there. We want something which is not present to me right now. We want to get rid of something which can be get rid of, or got rid of, which I am not. But you cannot get yourself or get rid of yourself. Isn't it true? Your own self. Can you get it? You already have it. You have it choicelessly. Can you get rid of it? No. You can change certain characteristics of it. So in the third state. Causal state now. <laughs> okay. One more thing about memory and direct experience. Um, the mind recollects experiences in the past and that is what we call memories. Recovers past, traces of past experience. That's what we call memory. It's a vritti in the mind and what we reco recollect is called the vishaya. Vishaya means object. So that, that food which I had eaten, uh, that food is the vishaya object and the memory, the movement in the mind is the vritti, that is called memory. 
the Atman, follow this carefully, the Atman, the Self, the Turiya, is not a Vishaya of this Vritti, is not an object of memory. But, but, whenever there is memory, it is the illuminer, Prakashaka of that memory. Whenever memory is functioning, whenever you remember something, whenever you fail to remember something, whether you remember or you fail to remember, the consciousness behind it, which, which illumines it, which reveals the functioning of memory. So memory does not reveal Atman. Atman reveals the functioning or the failure of memory. This is the point. Neither the object of the mind, nor the mind. In Sanskrit, Vishaya Vritti. Neither of them can affect this Turiyam. No, nothing that you can think of has any effect, any effect on your real self. And none of the thoughts that you think has any effect on the, in, on the self. So this is Tattvad Apratyuto Bhavet. Do not slip away from the truth which you are. You cannot slip away. Now, I have been beating about the bush long enough. Wait, wait. Okay, we'll listen to the question and then go on to start the first verse. There's a reason why I was hesitating to start the first verse. The first verse itself of this of the third chapter is strong medicine. It requires an entire background of what we have done to take that because it's quite shocking the way he begins. That's why it's one hesitates to give such things to good people. <laughs> <laughs> But you are already well versed in Vedanta, so I, I hope you have got enough immunity to take the shock. Because the first verse itself dismisses 99% of what we call religion and morality. Terrible shock. Especially to good people, to religious people. To atheists and evil people, they'll say, ah, I knew it. <laughs> yes. That untethered soul or something? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. He calls it the inner roommate, which yeah. I think is nice. Because you're, it's like you're living with a roommate inside of you who constantly narrates stuff mm -hmm. for you. Uh, and my question is, how did we become ignorant in the first place? Ah. <laughs> There's no answer to it. <laughs> There's no answer to it. But you might say, oh, isn't, isn't that a cop-out? Isn't that an escape? No, it is not. How did I become ignorant? Let's take a simple case. This is a very profound case. How did I become ignorant of my real nature, which has resulted in this horrible mess called samsara? How did I become ignorant? Um, let me give you the actual answer. The, what what you would, uh, a teacher in the Himalayas would say if you ask this question. They would say in Hindi at first that... Uh, Agyan ko siddh karne ki koshish mat ki ji, agyan ko kaatne ki koshish ki ji. Do not try to establish ignorance, try to cut down ignorance. What does that mean? Consider a simple case, a very simple case. Suppose, do you know Russian? Do, do you know Russian? Russian, Russian the language? <laughs> Rus Russian? No. You're, you're German? Yes. Good, so, but you don't know Russian, the language? So you are ignorant of Russian? That is, you don't know the language? I don't know if it's ignorance, I just don't know it. You don't know it. That, that's what I mean by ignorance. Just, I, that I don't know it. That's all. That's all. Now, not knowing is ignorance. So you are ignorant of Russian. I am ignorant of Russian. Now suppose I ask you, when did this ignorance of Russian start? When did it start? You can say from my birth. Oh, so you knew Russian before your birth? No, so I can't. The question is not quite right. You really cannot ask when and how ignorance started. Do you see what I mean? There's a philosopher, J. N. Mahanti, who pointed this out a long time ago. I thought it was a very nice thing. We've always read ignorance. Vedanta says ignorance is beginningless. Ignorance is uh, uncaused, beginningless. But I thought that was sort of... What do you mean? It's, they're trying not to answer our questions. But this professor, J. N. Mahanti, uh, in, in the Institute of Culture in Kolkata, in one of his classes, he said, it's actually a very simple truth. We are all know it. Any kind of ignorance, any kind of not knowing in the world is causeless. You can't say, it started because of this. It sounds unsatisfactory, I know, but that's the way it is. So, so the thing to do with ignorance is not to find out its cause, because you'll never find it out. 
The thing to do with it is to overcome it. Once you see that such a thing is presented to you and your feeling is, okay, there could be something in it, let me find out. Not Russian. Not uh, Russian, you are free to learn. <laughs> but this one, this one is really, really worthwhile finding out. That am I this uh, thing which... See, these three I know. Waking, dreaming, deep sleep straight away. This is one I don't know. This I'm ignorant of. This one the Upanishad wants to wants us to find out. Ignorance. And the other, um, many answers are possible. One answer is, um, I've given you Alan Watts answer. And once, Alan Watts, he was a philosopher in the Bay Area. Buddhism in 1960s up to 70s, he was very, very popular on the YouTube and all that. His book, The Taboo Against Knowing Who You Are. This, this little book, The Secret, wonderful book. Uh, he was profoundly influenced by Advaita and Buddhism. So he taught, and he was English, and very witty. So his answer to your question is this. How did we become ignorant is this. That God was all alone. Yeah. Eternally, from eternity to eternity, God was. But eternity is a long time to be alone. So God got bored. And then God decided to play. Yeah, to have fun, to play. But whom could God play with? This is a story. He's made up the story. Whom could God play with? There's nobody else to play with. So God is decided to make somebody to play with. But there's nobody else. Now God being God is awfully smart. So he hit upon a solution. What is the solution? God decided to be not God. Now there are two. God and not God. Now God has somebody to play with. God and not God. But then a problem came. God, because he's God, is awfully good at what he does. So when he decided to be not God, he really did a good job of it. And he totally forgot that he was God. And now not God, as not God, is searching for God's own God nature. That is samsara. That's who you are. <laughs> that's, that's ignorance. <laughs> uh, but that's a way of, just a way of putting it. Uh, anyway, we will not go any further into that. Um, hold on, let me just start this first because I promised to start the third chapter. There's no way of avoiding it. Get ready. Now you will see why all this background was necessary <coughs> to absorb the shock of this verse. So Gaurapada starts with this. Upasana Shrito Dharmo Upasana Shrito Dharmo Jate Brahmani Vartate Jate Brahmani Vartate Pragut Patte Rajam Sarvam Pragut Patte Rajam Sarvam Tena So Kripana Smritaha Tena So Kripana Smritaha the jiva who thinks that I am a simple individual being, you know, I'm in search of liberation, God, enlightenment, freedom, and I shall worship God, my Krishna, my Durga, my Shiva, my Jesus, I shall worship God, and ultimately I shall attain to God. So this relationship that the worshipper sets up, a duality, I shall attain to God. Before my birth, probably, maybe I was one with God. After my death, I shall go to heaven and become one with God. I was one with God before, I will be one with God afterwards. Before the universe was created, it was perfectly alright, was with God. After one day the universe will be dissolved, it will become all become absorbed with God. But right now, the universe is separate from God. I am separate from God. And by this worship, by prayer and worship and devotion and religion, I shall attain to God. Kripana Smitaha is the worst abuse that the Upanishad can give. Kripana is petty, mean, worthless. This kind of thinking which most good people in the world hold on to. He says, this is absolutely wrong. So, Kripana Smritaha. Kripana means small, tiny, fractured, cut off from reality. 
Literally in, in Indian languages, Kripana means miser. Miserly, right? In many Indian languages. The original uh, uh, Sanskrit in the Upanishads, it means the one who is cut off from one's own vast un unlimited nature. Um, in two of the Upanishads, it is said, the one who departs from this life without enlightenment, without realizing I am Brahman, sa Kripanaha. That person is limited, that person is, is, is small, is petty. Uh, and this is what he calls religion. Now, this is very shocking. But now you can realize why. What does he mean? Straight away. So this is going to be very shocking. And this is what really upsets dualists and religious people about non-dualism. Uh, though we may sugarcoat the pill, but at, at its core is this kind of a attitude towards religion. That is why sometimes it can be used in a very unkind and immature way. Like Totapuri, when Sri Ramakrishna was worshipping Divine Mother, Totapuri said, what are you doing? Going to the temple and worshipping that image. Why did he react that way to, um, to Sri Ramakrishna? Of course, Sri Ramakrishna taught him a very nice lesson afterwards. But, but it's because of this kind of philosophy. So first we must understand what's going on here. They have a very good reason to say this. So once you are trapped in this, there's no escape. What they are saying is, you know what you are saying when you say, I am a small creature, helpless creature, God is all powerful, wonderful and gracious, I shall worship God and attain unto God, and finally it will all be alright. Finally means, after death, in heaven, or in unity with God, something will happen, and then I will be, it will be alright. It's basically you identifying yourself with the body-mind as a karyam, as an effect. You are trying to attain the cause. It's the pot saying, once I become a lump, a featureless mass, the samsara will be solved. No. The one which has, which, who made the pot out of a lump of clay can again make you into a, into a pot again. The one who created this vast universe, God who is playing in while in what state. If you one day the universe ceases and God ceases play and we go back to the original state, God can play again. Why not? Srishti is there, projection, sthiti, existence. And ultimately there will be cosmic dissolution, pralaya. This person is saying, at that time everything will be perfect. Pragutpatter ajam sarvam. Before creation, after cosmic dissolution, only one infinite God remains. That is perfect. But if that is the point, then again from that creation will come. Why not? In the endless cycle it can come and go. It's like in the seed everything was perfect. But the tree has so many problems. Well, you go back to the seed again, it will come back again. The tree will come back again. No, that is not the way out. Um, so that is what uh, Gaudapada wants to say. He says, Kripanaha. And the word here used for jivas, individual sentient beings, is dharmaha. Dharmaha, it's a very strange word. Because dharma, is, dharma for individual beings is something that is used by Buddhists. So a lot of Buddhist terms are there in the Mandukya, which led to a lot of controversy. Is To what extent is Gaudapada influenced by Buddhism? Clearly, this word is one, one of the flashpoints. Dharmaha means individual sentient beings, identified with body and mind. So they think by worshipping, by surrender, by faith, by religious performances, one will attain to perfection. What they can attain to, you see, it's true. One can attain to a kind of heaven. One can attain to a proximity with, with the divine personage of God. All that is possible. Gaudapada does not deny any of religion. But he says no final solution is to be found there. You will come back again. As long as you, why will you come back again? As long as you, you circulate here, you are under the realm of causality, of change, of duality. Moment you say upasana, upasana is worship. I and the Lord, we worship. Immediately duality comes in there. If you have duality, there is a possibility of change. There is a possibility of change, there is a cause and effect relationship. God is the cosmic cause and we are all effects. If this is where you choose to dwell, there is no escape for you. So this is what he wants to say. The reality is beyond these three, the underlying thurium. That has to be realized. Not through upasana, 
not through worship. You cannot um, uh, realize the truth by worshipping the snake. You must inquire into the snake and find that the snake is not the reality, the rope is the reality. You must inquire into waking, dreaming and deep sleep to find that the underlying thurium is the reality. And that releases you. I am that thurium. That releases you forever, here and now. Here and now. Alright. Now, a caveat here. Never ever abandon your practices. From now onwards, I'm going to toss out all the icons and um, images and uh, all my prayer books. I'm going to stop going to church or temple. No. Disaster lies that way. No. Advaita has a twofold use for worship. One is as a preparation for Advaita. As a preparation for this. See, what Advaitins, the non-dualists object to is when you keep this dualistic mode as the ultimate reality. What the dualistic approach says is that they don't even consider this. They say you are this individual being and you must worship the cosmic cause, God. That's it, finished. That's what Advaita objects to. That is not, cannot be the ultimate purpose. There is no end in that. But it can be an extraordinary preparation. It can be an extraordinary preparation. This upasana is worship, so it's a religious duality. In this world, waking world, it's a, um, uh, it's a secular duality. But worship of God is again duality, but a religious kind of duality. Even there, there is no freedom. But Advaita says it's a good preparation. I have myself seen some of the people who catch this Advaitic message very fast are some of the senior monks. You say, of course they do. They have been studying Advaita. No. By nature dualistic. By nature devotional. Yet when I speak about it, they seem to catch it just like that. It's because of that preparation. The genuine preparation, the simplicity of mind, the, the purity of mind. When you actually explain it to, it, to them, it doesn't take much. It immediately they say, yes, this is the way it is. This, they almost see it directly. So that the devotional approach, the dualistic approach is good practice, but only as practice. The non-dualist will say only as a preparatory practice. That's one aspect of upasana, of worship. The other aspect is upasana as an expression of non-duality. Enlightenment, but after that also, Worship of God is, is, is very much possible and is an expression of your enlightenment. How? If after enlightenment, the enlightened person can walk and talk and eat and laugh and joke, can he not uh, worship God? Don't we chant every day before food, Brahma Arpanam Brahma Havi Brahma Agno Brahma Nautam Brahma Tena Gantabhyam Brahma Karma Samadhina this offering is Brahman, the, the instrument by which you offer is Brahman, the one to whom you offer is Brahman, the one who offers is Brahman, the one who sees Brahman in every action, note, note, note that, in every action, that one attains Brahman. So action is spiritualized on the foundation of non-duality. We are using action to attain to non-duality. Can you not use worship, upasana to attain non-duality? Of course you can. That explains the devotional approach taken by Shankaracharya and many great non-dualists. They worship the divine, knowing their fundamental unity with the divine. That's the highest kind of worship. Soham miti bhave na pujayet. Worship the Lord. What is the attitude? Soham, I am He. That's also a worship. In Uttarakhand, they, they, <laughs> they have these nice sayings. Um, <laughs> it works only in Hindi, very simple kind of Hindi. I myself am God, never is he apart from me. It has, doesn't have the same punch in English, the zip in it, which the Hindi has. <laughs> so, this kind of worship, so these are the uh, approaches. Uh, hold on to the question, one more. I've told you this earlier. The wrong uh, or the harmful uh, effect of misunderstanding this half digested non-duality non very dangerous these highest philosophy but the problem with highest philosophy is it also can be very dangerous um, Gaudapada who teaches Shunyavada the philosophy of the void in the Mula Madhyamaka Karika 
not Godapada, Nagarjuna. Nagarjuna, in the Mula Madhyamaka Karika, um, he lived about 700 years before Godapada, according to modern historians. He says, the one, the shunyata, emptiness, is the solution to all worldly conceptions. But the one who takes emptiness itself to be another reality, for, who, for him there is no help at all. And he says, it's like yatha sarpo durgrihita, like a snake wrongly caught. If you catch a snake at the wrong end, you're going to get bitten and die. So, one who misunderstands non-duality, um, it, it's very dangerous. I'll give you an example. I was in one text which is often, come, 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 come. One text which is often uh, responsible for, for such misunderstandings, of course, this one, Man, uh, Mandukya Karika. I remember once, um, before my time, a great Swami was visiting the monastery in Belur where the young novices were being trained. And he asked, what are you studying? What are you teaching the young boys? Somebody said, we are studying the Mandukya. He said, no, 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 don't teach the Mandukya. They'll become atheists. <laughs> and another example I've also given to you, another text which is responsible for such misunderstandings often is the Ashtavakra. So I remember I was in the Himalayas and there was another gentleman who was staying in a cottage just near my, up above the road next to my cottage. And this gentleman had retired from a government job in Dehradun. And he was the disciple of his, of a very good sadhu. I know that sadhu in Dehradun, a very well-known sadhu. Now that gentleman was sitting and spending his days in, in the, he had come away to Gangotri, 10,000 feet in the Himalayas and reading Ashtavakra. So was I. And the gentleman was so happy to see that I was reading Ashtavakra. And he said, my guru, he never told me about the, this. This is the real stuff. <coughs> My guru, he just worships the Tulsi plant and keeps fast and <laughs> he fasts and worships you know, the holy basil plant. And, um, now, I happen to know his guru, who, who is a really very good sadhu. So I said to him, does you, did your guru, does your, has your guru read the Ashtavakra? Does he know about it? He said, yes, I got the book from him. So after knowing the Ashtavakra, he's still going on doing all those, those rituals and worship. Then this man thought, oh, he thought, yeah, that is true. I hope some sense came into it on him after that. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, this is what I wanted to say about the first verse. You had questions? I'll come to you. Mm. Maharaj, I understand all this. But then how does a dualist get enlightened? Because a dualist sees God everywhere. So it's again duality. Hmm. So where is enlightenment? And if that is enlightenment, and a non-dualist is enlightened to his own self, uh, Atman is Brahman. So where is the reconciliation? Mm. There isn't. <laughs> that's why the, the, that's why the non-dualist will say that the dualist is stuck. Mm. Dualist is stuck. The dualist will say, you atheists don't talk to me. <laughs> I love my beloved Lord, my Krishna, my Kali, and I want to enjoy the company. See, whether you want to sip sugar or become sugar. Uh, Sri Ramakrishna asked Vivekananda, suppose uh, there's a bowl of nectar um, and would you, if you were a fly, would you want to, what would you want to do, sit, um, jump into it or sit on the edge and sip? Said, uh, he said, I'll sit on the edge and sip because if I jump into it, I might die. And then uh, Sri Ramakrishna said that this is the bowl of nectar. Uh, one, if you dive into it, you don't die, you become Im immortal. Nectar, in fact, in the Sanskrit word is Amrita, literally immortal. So when you jump into it, you become immortal. But yes, the fear is real. The fear is loss of individuality. When you become infinite, you are no longer one finite person separate from others. But the thing is, what Advaita wants to tell you is, you already are that infinite, choicelessly so. What Advaita wants you to do really, is you need not be afraid of that. Realize your infinite nature. And then live out the rest of the life of this finite personality in joy and peace and freedom. That's what Advaita gives you. This person will still continue. This body will still continue. The world will still appear. Waking will happen. Dreams will happen. Deep sleep will come and go. But now you are free. What Sri Ramakrishna says, he, he puts it so beautifully, that after Jnana comes Vijnana. When Vijnana comes, then what happens to waking, dreaming and deep sleep? What happens to samsara? He says, then samsara becomes Leela. It's the play of the divine. 
Now we may say it's the play of the divine, but it's not play to us. It's, it's very serious to us. When you realize the divine and you realize it uh, as joycelessly as your own self, then you're free. You're so happy with it. You, you, are, uh, you, are, you have no problem with the world anymore. There is no limit. There is no um, barrier. It's all you. See, what is samsara and what is freedom? All this is Brahman. I and all this is Brahman. This is a spirit, non-dual attitude. All of this is God. This is also spiritual. This is, in fact, one sadhu put it, the word used here is Kripana. Kripana means the small. Then what is the opposite? Godapada will say, I shall now teach in this chapter, Akarpanyam Vakshami. I am going to teach you the infinite, the not limited. Here is the limited. Who thinks God is separate from me? I will worship God and attain to God. I am going to teach you in this chapter. We shall speak about Akarpanyam, the infinite, the unlimited. Then what is unlimited? All is Brahman, unlimited, Akarpanyam. All is God, unlimited, Akarpanyam. I am indeed all of this, Akarpanyam, infinite. All of this is Maya, Akarpanyam, infinite. But we do not dwell in any of these. What we do is, I am separate from all of this. And I am this body and mind. Maybe I have an immortal soul which will go on to other lives, I don't know. And maybe there is a God, I'm trying to believe in God. This is samsara. This is kripana. Any one of those attitudes, the attitude of a true devotee, that also would be akarpanyam. Though Gaudapada does not speak about that, that also is akarpanyam, that's also infinite. In fact, the question was raised. Um, Sri Chaitanya, one of the teachers, he said this. Sri Chaitanya and other teachers of bhakti, how will they respond to this verse? They will say, that Sadhu said very interestingly, he said, Baba, hum upasana kaha karte? Hum to prem karte hain, bhakti karte hain. Yes. Upasana, we are not this dualistic worshipper that the Upanishad talks about and condemns, or what Gaudapada condemns. What is dualistic worship? There is a deity. And I now symbolize it through images and concepts and uh, I have for mo formal modes of physical worship, mental worship, all of this goes on. This is what is called Vaidhi Bhakti, formal ritualistic worship. But Chaitanya, the great teachers of Bhakti, Ramanuja, Chaitanya especially, they, they say love of God, not a formal, formal worship of God. That is something they say to be transcended as fast as possible. And this mad love of God without any restraint, without any limitations, without any kind of worldliness, how is that different from uh, the Akarpanyam of Advaita, the infinitude of Advaita? No, no. That, the Sadhu put it very beautifully. If you ask Chaitanya with this verse, how do you respond? He says, you are, Gaudapada says you are Kripana, that you are limited, you are mean, you are petty. He will say, my child, where am I doing this Upasana? I am in love with God. I Upasana thodi karta hu, I to prem karta hu, bhakti karta hu. So, they will make a distinction. Sri Ramakrishna would of course agree with this. So yes, the reconciliation is in the higher bhakti. Gaudapada will not talk about it. He is not going down that lane. But, uh, but yes, the reconciliation is the higher bhakti. If somebody wants to, he is not cutting down that, that avenue. Because you will attain to God in that avenue. And it, it cannot be denied. And Sri Ramakrishna is living proof of that. That's what Ayan Maharaj is going on about. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Did Gaudapada have a relationship with God? Do you know? Yes, yes. He did. Yes, he did. That's very interesting. Normally, we don't talk about that. He's seen as a radical non dualist. But there is a text written by Gaudapada called Su Bhagodaya. I've got it. It's a tantric text which deals with the worship of Divine Mother. Is that a tantric text? Yeah, it's a tantric. I've got it. Very interesting. It is only in this way it can be reconciled. Not, not, not as this um, dualistic, separate kind of worship. Because he's very harsh in what he says. Yes, he's very harsh. Yes. Christ, then people didn't want to lynch him. Yeah. Harsh no, in <laughs> in India, you you, you can you, that was always it was it was very pluralistic, very open, as far back as you go. Somebody said, somebody said, contrasting uh, ancient Middle East and uh, India. He says, I think Vivekananda himself said. 
Buddha preached and railed against the Vedas and the, the sacrifices there and the Hindu gods and goddesses and tramped the paths, the dusty paths of North India till his 80th birthday, nobody ever harmed him. They became his disciples in the thousands. And Christ there criticized the orthodoxy of, of his prevailing times in, in the, uh, 2000 years ago in ancient Palestine. They put him on a cross. So, it's because, um, not that there was no orthodoxy in India at that time, there was. But there was also this deep underlying uh, respect for uh, multiplicity, plurality. Because this idea is there, ekam sat vipra bahuda vadanti, you see. Truth is one, the sages call it variously. So what did the, the Hindus do with the Buddhists? They honored him, the one who criticized the most venerable texts of their own tradition. And they accepted him as their, as their own. So they, 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 um, they, they took him in as, and they sort of reabsorbed him into Hinduism, made him an avatar. <laughs> yes. Um, so if I'm worshipping as an expression of non-duality, huh. and say if I want to worship Lord Shiva or huh. Kalima, what do they represent from the Dvaita uh, perspective? Right. I am Turiyam. This is the reality. But now, this Turiyam is the waker here, the Vishwa, the you or I, and is also Ishwara. In this level of, see, these are two levels. This is called Vyavaharika, transactional. This is called Paramarthik, absolute. Absolute, I and Shiva are one, Shivoham. But in that Vyavaharika level, I, the same reality, as body-mind, I am worshipping my beloved Shiva, who is ultimately my real nature. But as this individual being is my worshipped beloved uh, deity Shiva. But that's not the ultimate truth about us. I see. So does Shiva hmm. represent Turiyam? Or yes. yes. Shiva represents Turiyam. I also represent Turiyam. What does Shiva represent here? When I am, when I am the uh, Vishwa, the waker, then Shiva becomes Ishwara, Hiranyagarbha, Virat. Actually Ishwara basically. Uh, that Turiyam with Maya. These two, these two make to make a clear difference between these two levels. So, isn't Ishwara the third, the cause of one? Yes. So, is Shiva the causal? She, she was, she was the causal one. Yeah, yeah. Okay. She was the causal one. Causal one, and also the subtle and the gross. But when you worship Shiva, you worship as Saguna Brahman. So that is the causal aspect of Shiva. So then, why do people say like he is the destroyer of the universe? He is. What is the cause? What is your deep sleep? Isn't it the destroyer of waking and dreaming? Isn't it, isn't it also the source of waking and dreaming? So Shiva is the source of the universe, the destroyer of the universe, and also the ground of this universe. The clay out of which the pot is born, isn't the, uh, or, you know, the karanam, the cause, is the source of the effect, is the sustenance of the effect, is the ultimate dissolution of the effect. That sounds very philosophical, but practically when you look at it, Suppose the wave in the ocean, where was it born? It was born from the ocean. Where does it exist? It exists in the ocean. Where will it go? It will dissolve into the ocean. Then the ocean is the creator, preserver and destroyer of the wave. Correct. But beyond ocean and wave, there is another higher reality or deeper reality. What is that? Water. Why is water more deeper than uh, a greater reality than the ocean itself? Because without water, no ocean. Without ocean, water can be there. Can be water vapor. Can be in some other form. In fact, the reality of the ocean is water. The reality of the wave is water. But when it is expressed, then the wave is the worshipper of the ocean. Very good, no problem. But what Gaudapada wants to say is that realize your nature as water. Then you become one with everything. Then you become the reality which cannot be affected by waves, ocean or anything at all. But as long as you have an identity as a wave, you are subject to creation, you are subject to changes in life, you are subject to death and coming back again and again. Yeah. So what would Kalima represent then? Same. Same. Saguna Brahman, Same. Shiva. Okay. That is the idea in Hinduism. Kali, Durga, Shiva, Vishnu, they are all called Saguna Brahman. In fact, when you go to the respective Shastras, uh, the mantras, you will see they all have the same definition. Consciousness with the power of Maya. Now, because they are in, it is infinite, 
You can think of it as Kali, you can think of it as female, you can think of it as male, you can think of it beyond gender, you can think of it with form, with different forms, without form. All of that is perfectly all right because it's infinite. The truth is one and infinite. Therefore, you can speak about it. If the truth is one, if the sages call it variously and it's limited, a specific truth, then the sages speak of it variously, the sages will be liars then. If 2 plus 2 is 4, you can't speak of it variously. You have to say it's 2 plus 2, 4. But if it is limit, it is limitless, if it is infinite, and if it is beyond language, the infinite truth, when you try, and beyond language, when you try to express it in language, you are bound to express it differently. You are bound to express it variously. That is the meaning. That is the a, a crucial difference. Um, Vivekananda said, in the ancient Aryans in India, there was religious conflict there. But very early on, they discovered this. And it led to, it provided the foundation for religious harmony in India for thousands of years. Imagine, such a religious country, but almost, but so little religious violence. In, in 5,000 years of history, until in fact the coming of the um, uh, Muslims, there was almost hardly any kind of internal religious warfare. Although there was tremendous religious ferment all the time. There are so many religious, about Buddhism came up. At one time, Jainism was very extraordinarily popular. So many people became Jains. At one time, so many became, people became Buddhist. At one time, so many pe people became uh, Vaishnava. Yeah. So, um, Indians here, our forefathers, at one time, they might have been Buddhists. At one time, they might have been Tantrics. At one time, they might have been Shaivas or Vaishnavas and so on. And it's perfectly all right. And each school was competing. It's not that they did not, they're all nice to each other. No, no. They're fiercely competing. Um, Will Durant said that it's like a, a gladiator wars, but at the level of intellect. And the, the Shastra, the, the discussions about uh, scriptural interpretation, doctrines, dogmas, but never down to the level of the sword and persecution. It ne never at that level. And this is a remarkable thing when you can compare it with the history of the Middle East, uh, where the same thing was discovered by the ancient Jewish prophets, by the Christians, by the Muslims later on. Same reality. It, they are genuine religions. Sri Ramakrishna attests to it. Exactly as genuine as the Hindu religions. But somehow, the truth and anything against the truth has to be cut down. When you put it that way, it leads to enormous violence. Enormous violence. My, my understanding, and in this country, after coming to this country, I'm beginning to get a better feel for it. It's exactly the same problem in Judaism, Christianity, Islam. The only saving grace for Judaism is it's not a converting religion. There are strict um, things about, you know, like against trying to impose your view on the other. But the same kind of uh, um, uh, narrowness is there. Uh, and this thing we understand in India also. It's, it's, same thing can be there. But when you remove that, with all the best intentions, when you remove those restrictions, when Judaism is no longer an ethnic religion, the first thing that the Christians made it was it's open to everybody. A beautiful idea. But it carries with it the seed of enormous violence. The moment it is open to everybody, and the moment I have the truth, and I can give it to you, and I can save you with it. If I can save you with it, let me do it by a hook or crook. Let me do it by any means whatsoever. And if it's the truth, then what you have must be false. You, what you have is false. What I have is right. And I, you are welcome to come into my fold. If, you're, if you say no thanks, I will not take no for an answer. <laughs> have you noticed that? So that's what happened. Well, one of the seeds for the foundation of this country was the persecution of certain churches in Europe. They came over here. And because of that, there's tremendous uh, freedom here. But... I notice a difference between religious freedom in USA and religious freedom in India. The spirit of openness and acceptance is there in the, in the Constitution of the United States and the Bill of Rights. So each man is free to worship God as he wishes, but not within the Christian churches in the, in the United States. There's a whole range. Some of them are very liberal, very open, but many of them, they have the same DNA going back 2000, 2500 years to the Middle East. I, myself, I am right. I was persecuted for this by the Catholics in Europe. Now I'm going to persecute you. I, my little church is right and everybody else. All the, One um, Swami told me, I, we asked, why did you become, uh, he's from Carolina, I think, um, uh, South Carolina. 
uh, how, how did you become a Vedantist? And he said, look, when I grew up, it was a very conservative Christian thing, but, and our minister told us that we were right, and my friends, my classmates, they were all going to go to hell. And very soon I discovered they thought the same about me. <laughs> because I'm right, they are wrong, and they're thinking they are right, and I'm wrong. And I came to the conclusion, well, probably everybody's wrong. And he became non-religious, but it was a spiritual quest. Then he read a book, Vedanta for the Western World. He read it in Sweden. And uh, it said, when he read that, he said, there's another alternative to this. Maybe everybody's right. Not in every detail. Of course not. That would be crazy. But details are different. But the central truth is absolutely the same in every religion. I was listening to a talk by um, um, like one of those very narrow evangelist speeches. It will really make you furious. Everybody is a sinner to him. And so he, stands and he stands in front of churches and yells at all the people going to the church that you are all sinners. You are all going to go into hell. But think about it. What he is saying, I am able to look through that very offensive presentation, look through it to this essential message. It's still the same message. Yeah. The packaging is very offensive. <laughs> Is very rough. But it's the same message. There is an ultimate reality. You realize it, you are safe. Your problems are solved. You don't realize it, you are inviting trouble. Exactly the highest non-dual Hindu philosophy, Godapada is saying, Kripana. Uh, you are in serious trouble if you don't realize that. Same thing. Yes. Yes, I'll come to you. Okay. Um, Alan Watts says um, Zen Buddhism is just cool Hinduism. That's, that's his words. Zen Buddhism is cool Hinduism. Cool yeah. Hinduism. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you go to uh, a tea meditation ceremony, hmm. you make it very clear that it's about meditation. Hmm. So it seems like it's a very evolved version of uh, non-dualism. Oh, oh. But then in Hinduism, you are supposed to do sandhya mantra. Oh. It's a grim duty, mm -hmm. right? So, do you think our rituals need some evolution? There, how do we, oh. how do we become cool Hinduism? <laughs> yes, is Zen cool Hinduism? Um, see. The Sandhya Vandram is a grim duty, it's because we are made into that. If you actually see into the heart of what it is, it's a beautiful ritual. Uh, but we have made it into a, into a dry mechanic. Any kind of ritual can become dry. And I'm sure if you drink tea like that morning and evening, you're going to get sick of it <laughs> very soon. Now, um, cool Hinduism, that reminds me of something. I, I'll share it openly now. It's a person I'm talking about is long gone. It was about Swami Pavitrananda. I heard this in Santa Barbara. At that time, Zen had become very popular. It was in the 1960s, 50s, uh, in 60s. So one of the nuns in Santa Barbara told me that uh, one day, Pavitra, this is in the early 70s actually. So Pavitrananda ji, who was here, and he was the minister here from 1951 to 1977. <coughs> he used to visit um, California every summer, the Vedanta Society of Southern California, because the founder there, Prabhavanji, was his friend, the two, the two friends. So, one day the nuns there asked him, Zen Buddhism, which was very popular there, uh, Swami, what do you think of Zen Buddhism? And the Swami, it seems, was, uh, he sp spoke very little and cryptic. Swami, what do you think of Zen Buddhism? Or what do you think of Zen? Swami, what do you think of Zen? Perverted Buddhism. <laughs> make, make of that what you will. <laughs> Uh, no, uh, I, I understand why Zen seems to be cool, but you know, if you pursue it a little deeply, um, ultimately, what does it? Uh, it leads to the same reality, no doubt, Satori realization. Yes, but um, the approach is a little different. Zen, the word itself, has very interesting roots. Chan, Chan dhyana. The the Sanskrit word for meditation, dhyana, becomes the Tibetan and uh, jhana, a Pali jhana. And then that becomes the Chinese Chan. And the Chinese Chan becomes the Japanese Zen. So it, there are definitely roots in Buddhism. Of course, it's Buddhistic. It would roots in India too. Uh, so it comes from there. But there's a difference. The Zen approach is basically to short-circuit the intellect. 
So something like a koan is given in one of the, uh, not, I don't know, the Rinzai Zen or Soto Zen, one of the Zen, they say meditation on a koan, a paradoxical saying, what's the sound of one hand clapping? What's the sound of one hand clapping? Don't give me an answer. Sit and meditate on it. How long? Hours and hours and days and days and months and months and years and years. What is the sound of one hand clapping? A Hindu would say, I can, if I devote this time to meditating on Kali or Krishna or Shiva, I would become enlightened much sooner. <laughs> but anyway, now the point is not to get an answer. It's a question which the intellect cannot give an answer to. If you come up with an answer, there are stories of students coming up with the answer and they go quickly. You have to tell the teacher, the Roshi, that I have come with this answer. And he says, he opens his mouth and is going to give an give answer to that. Um, and the Roshi has a bamboo stick and he hits him on the head with it. Go back and meditate. And second time he comes, when he opens his mouth, even before he started to give the answer, the, <laughs> the bamboo stick comes whack. Go back and meditate. And then finally when he comes back, his face is supposed to be shining with the truth and realization. And the Roshi says, yes, you've got it. So this is the way they approach it. And they call realization Satori. And does it work? I, I'm personally sure that it does work. And if you see the examples of enlightenment, there are different degrees of opening up. So it does work. It's there. But uh, uh, what about your devotional instinct? What about your instinct to do something? What about your instinct to understand? Your jnana uh, side of it, the bhakti side of it, the karma side of it, all of it is supposed to be curbed, held in check. Only the meditation aspect is emphasized there. Whereas in Vedanta, all aspects are emphasized. Uh, question. Yes, come to you. Yeah. You. Going back to highest devotion, having highest devotion. It's all out of the syllabus questions. <laughs> Just stick to Gaudapada. Huh? Tell me. Yeah. Um, I thought you mentioned that even with the highest devotion, one can uh, be at head moksha. Um, in that case, why don't I fully at least uh, ask uh, Sri Ramakrishna? When he was, uh, oh, oh. Right. Oh, to cut the kali uh, with the sword of knowledge, he says, so that the formless aspect will be realized. But after you realize the formless aspect, the form is also the same reality. Uh, saguna and nirguna, saka, sakara and nirakara. Sakara is with form. Akara means form. Sakara means with form. Nirakara, without form. The om, for example, without form. Formless and the form. Both are the same reality. That is what you realize. But before that, when you think the form alone is the reality, the formless has not been realized yet, you must go beyond. So the Zen saying is also there, if you meet the Buddha on the path, kill the Buddha or cut the Buddha in half. Which means go beyond the Buddha or go beyond that most beloved, uh, the Ishta Devata which you are experiencing. Not that not you are giving up Kali. You are realizing the formless aspect of Kali. So that is what Totapuri pushed Sri Ramakrishna into. But what Totapuri's problem was, the formless is the, uh, the highest, it is the real stop. Sri Ramakrishna says, now come back and look at Kali and people in the world. You see the same reality, the formless is the form. That story I've told you about in Uttarakhand, it, it works only in Hindi, but I'll tell you again. There was this uh, Pandit who argued for um, uh, the with form, God with form is real. Sakar such hai. Sakar such hai. The God with form. Because he was a worshipper of Krishna or something like that. So God with form is real. Um, and the non-dualist, yeah. the Swami who was a non-dualist, the monk with whom he argued, he said Niraka, the formless is real. And they argued and argued and argued and finally this um, Pandit devotee, he agreed. He said, Swami, you are right. The formless alone is real. Nirakar such hai. Aap thik bolte hai. Nirakar such hai. And then the Swami replied, Aur sakar tera chacha hai. <laughs> what does it mean in English? The formless, I agree. God without form is the ultimate reality. You are right. At that point, the Swami who had been arguing for the formless reality says, then what about the one with form with whom you are arguing for till now? Is it your uncle? Who's, who's that? Your uncle? It, you can't translate the idiom into English. It simply means it's the same reality. You're making the same mistake again. Uh, 
Yes, last question. All out of the question syllabus questions. So Nobody is asking about God of Father and Turi and everybody is worried about poor God and, and the worship of God. Go on. Yeah. So is that non-dualistic or worship no. of God with love? No, it's not. It's dualistic. But the thing is, it's dualistic. But the thing is, um, what the non-dualist would say that, understand the non-dual background of this worship. Sri Ramakrishna said, Tie the knowledge of non-duality to the hem of your cloth and then do whatever you like. In Bengali, Tie the knowledge of non-duality to the hem of your cloth and do what? Hem of your cloth is a, is a tip Bengali saying. In, I mean, in India, um, women of earlier generations, they had, didn't have pockets. So they would tie the keys of the household to the, to the sari. To the, yeah. um, I've seen my grand, grandmother do it also. Now it's, everybody has pockets. <laughs> I'll tell you a funny story about pockets. So, Sri Ramakrishna said, tie the knowledge of non-duality to the hem of your cloth and then do whatever you like. Do whatever you like means, then if you want to do service, do ser serve, <coughs> God, uh, serve God in, in uh, all beings. If you want to do devotion, worship God in the form of Kali, Krishna, whatever you like. If you want to remain immersed in meditation, remain immersed in meditation. Uh, you can do whatever you like. So, then the non-dualist has no objection. What the non-dualist is objecting to is, that object is God. See, this was at the root of the, uh, the do not worship an image, the commandments. Idolatry, why is it taken as such a big, a big problem in the Abrahamic religions? Because if you think that God is an object out there, a thing, that's definitely not God. Because God is the subject, inner subject, the Turiya is the, the reality beyond. Now that became a huge issue because uh, there's a context to it. In the Middle East, there were people worshipping uh, images in the, in the very grossest form with human sacrifice and things like that. So uh, um, the Abrahamic religions, Moses and all that, they cut it down at the root. But then the problem became, that also became an issue of fanaticism. So when they encountered, encountered this panoply of images, with the Ganesha and the Ten Arms and the things like that, and they thought, ah, here are those graven images. We must destroy them. So whether it is the Christian or the Muslim, they came and smashed temples and idols and things like that. And, and so they think we are doing the right thing. The, we are following the commandment. They don't understand the, the worship that the Hindus did was a much more sophisticated thing. They understood the uh, idea that it is not an object. But the thing is, to have any kind of practice, you need an object to help you. But you know that's not the ultimate reality. You know that the pure consciousness, which is not an object, is the ultimate reality. After that, when if you see the mantras of pujas, uh, they make it very clear that God is not a thing out there. Uh, but that was not seen. They just saw the images and they saw there was enormous violence against uh, uh, Hindu places of worship. Um, so that was the, that's the point of the non-dualist. Don't take it as an object. In fact, Keno Upanishad says, see, Nedam Yadidam Upasate, Tadeva Brahmatum Vidhi Nedam Yadidam Upasate, Yat Yat Chakshusha Napashyati, Yena Chakshumshi Pashyati, Tadeva Brahmatum Vidhi Nedam Yadidam Upasate, what the eyes cannot see, by which the eyes see, know that alone to be Brahman, not what you worship as this. Idam upasate. Yat shrotrena na srinoti, yena shrotram idam shrutam. What the ears cannot hear, but by which the ears hear, know that alone to be Brahman, the ultimate reality, not what you worship as this. See, can open it, one after another, one after another, it goes on saying this. The pure consciousness beyond all of this. So that's what the reality is. But the entire, then is the entirety of image worship wrong? That's why these subjects are so, have to be handled so carefully. So is uh, Gaurapada or the Upanishad saying that image worship is wrong? Not at all. If you look into the technology, it's a kind of technology. You look into the technology of those image worship, uh, that, um, the mantras associated with it, the rituals, the prana pratish time. If you see the actual process of puja, it's actually objectifying what is essentially a subject. 
and then again inviting that divinized um, object, the, the divinity back into the subject. That's what is done. Durga Puja is beautiful. At the end of the puja, how the image of the Divine Mother, first how it, it is, a presence is invoked in there. And the presence is invited back into your own consciousness again. Very sophisticated. In fact, if you push it further, this idea of God in heaven, God as the father, God as a, as a dualistic God, the Hindu can always claim that is idolatry. Because you are conceiving of a separate God. That's what Gaudapada is in fact condemning. He is condemning exactly that thing here. And so that is the, there is no to, uh, true freedom there. Then that limits you to this world of appearances. The first three. Yes. Thank you very much. We'll go on with this and see what Gaudapada has to teach. Right now he started with a few bitter words, harsh words, a wake-up call, and then we'll see where he goes with this. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanamastu